All right, so let's talk about the first law of thermodynamics now. What's the first? Before that, let's define what a state function is and what a path function is. A state function is a well-defined property of a system that's at equilibrium. So it's uh, if x is a state function, then we say that regardless how we carry out a change, how we go from one equilibrium state to another, the change in x only depends on what the final state is and what the initial state is. So it doesn't matter how you got there. Okay? So you can go through a series of processes. If you end up in the same final state and you start with the same initial state, the value, the change in x would be the same. So examples of state functions are pressure, volume, temperature, and we're going to be inventing a few more uh, as we go along. Today we're going to invent a new one called U, internal energy. Okay. Now, uh, a path function it is a quantity that's associated with a process, and it depends how you carry out the process. Okay, so as opposed to a state function. So Q, for example, we know, and W are path functions. If you remember, we said the amount of heat flow going from one state to another depends on whether you're carrying it out at constant pressure, or at constant volume. Okay, so Q and W will depend on how you got to your final state from your initial state. So those are examples of what we call path functions. The first law says, it's be, the first law is based on the fact that all measurements that we've done on Q and W suggest that even though Q and W themselves depend on the path, okay, so they depend on the path that you take to get from your initial state to the final state, it turns out regardless of how you go from your initial state to your final state, the sum of all the Qs and all the Ws depends only on the initial and final state. So Q depends on how you got there, W depends on how you got there, but Q plus W, that sum is always going to be the same for as long as you're talking about the same initial state and the final state. So that suggests that we can think of Q plus W as equal to a change in some state function. And so we're going to invent that state function now. We're going to call it internal energy, U, in your freshman chemistry uh, lab. Uh, textbooks, you're, this is called E. Okay, so your internal energy U, we say this. So, we, what we're saying is okay, if Q plus W is always going to be the same, uh, regardless of how you get from your initial state to your final state, as long as those two states are the same, then that means it must be equal to the change in some property of the system. And we call that property of the system internal energy. Okay, so we say that the change in U. Whatever this U is, if we're going to call it internal energy, it's going to be the sum of Q plus W. All right. So, in other words, the value of Q plus W is a manifestation of how this property, which we're calling internal energy, changes as we go from one equilibrium state to another. So, the first law of thermodynamics basically says that every system has a state function, which we're going to call U, and that for any, any change that the system undergoes, the change in U will just be equal to Q plus W. All right. What's the atomic interpretation of internal energy? Uh, at the atomic level, internal energy refers to the energy of the atoms and the molecules in the system. Okay. Uh, you've encountered the term thermal energy before. Thermal energy, uh, if you use that term, it refers to the kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules in the system. Okay. So what we call a thermal energy of our system is just the difference between its internal energy U and U naught. And U naught is simply the zero point energy. If you remember from quantum mechanics, okay, there's a minimum allowed energy. Okay, that's called your zero point energy. So zero point energy is the lowest energy allowed by quantum mechanics. Now, we do need to realize that thermodynamics developed independently of quantum mechanics, okay? So in pure thermodynamics, we just assume there's a thing called U. It's postulated, okay? 
whether or not our microscopic interpretation, our atomic interpretation is correct, whether or not quantum mechanics turns out to be correct or not. Okay. Uh, thermodynamics by itself does not really care. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, acceptability of thermodynamics has no uh, bear, uh, the validity of quantum mechanics has no bearing on the acceptability of quantum mechanics. But what we try to do here is we try to relate okay, the principles of thermodynamics to uh, the principles of quantum mechanics since we're dealing with chemistry. We're looking at the behavior of atoms and molecules. So um, thermodynamics, in fact, is solely based on the bulk behavior of matter. So it doesn't really matter what's going on at the molecular level as far as the principles of thermodynamics are concerned. Okay, we're looking at macroscopic measurements in thermodynamics. But this is, this is uh, but as we go along, we will be trying to get a molecular level interpretation, atomic level interpretation of uh, what we're seeing in, at the macroscopic level. Okay. Another way of saying the first law, it's really nothing more than the law of conservation of energy. Okay. Since any change in energy of the system, we said delta U, right? It's just equal to Q plus W. Well, we've already defined Qs and Ws as just a transfer of something from between system and surroundings. So all we're saying really then is that energy is neither created or nor destroyed. It's simply being transferred from system to surroundings or surroundings to system. Remember we said heat and W, Q and W are just ways of transferring energy. So, first law of thermodynamics says basically then that energy is neither created nor destroyed. All right. Another way you can say the first law is to say that the total internal energy of an isolated system is constant. Okay. Why is that? If your system is isolated, okay, then it won't have any surroundings to deal with, right? So Q is zero. There's no, there won't be any heat transfer, and there won't be any work involved. Okay, so for anything that's going on within the system, for the entire system, Q is zero, W is zero. So delta U, which just is going to be Q plus zero, uh, Q plus W is just going to be zero. Now you can think of the universe as just the sum of whatever system you're interested in plus the surroundings, right? System plus everything else is the universe. So you can think of the universe as an isolated system so you can also say the first law this way. The energy of the universe is constant. Okay. Question is, can we prove it? No, we can't. This is a postulate. This is a law. Uh, this, so we postulate, we assume it. And for as long as it works for us, we're okay. Okay. And it does. Sign conventions, just a review. Q and W, if you recall, are positive, okay, so the algebraic sign of Q and of W is positive if energy flows into the system, so if your energy goes into your system from the surroundings. Anytime you use these terms, Q, W, delta U, unless otherwise specified, we are referring to the system, okay? So Q is positive, W is positive if energy flows in the system, otherwise it's negative. Now delta U, since delta U is Q plus W, okay, and that means if heat flows, uh, energy flows into your system by way of heat or work, then delta U is going to be positive, right? That will give you a higher value of U in the final state compared to the initial state. So delta U is positive, there's, there's a net increase in U. But that depends on the algebraic signs of Q and W, okay? So you might have heat flow in, but your system could be doing work, so. So you have to take into account the algebraic sum of the Q's and W's to get the value of delta U. So here's a simple uh, concept check. Uh, suppose 10 joules of energy were absorbed by a system. What's delta U? Positive 10.0 joules. What's delta U for the surroundings? negative 10.0 joules. What's delta U for the universe? It's always going to be zero. So first law of thermodynamics. Energy of the universe is constant. 
So whatever delta u is for the system, that's going to be the negative of the delta u for the surroundings. Now, in older textbooks, and I believe chemical engineering textbooks, you might see this alternate convention for W. Instead of Q plus W in older textbooks, you may see it written as Q minus W. That has to do with the convention for the algebraic sign of W. If work is done by the system, okay, if you define what's as work as the amount of energy done by the system, then the convention goes with Q minus W. But what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're defining W not as the work done by the system, but the, the energy change in the system because of work. Okay? So when we say W here, we mean the change in energy of the system because of work. So if a system is doing work, then W is negative. And so we just use the plus here. So in that convention, we say Q. Uh, delta U is equals Q plus W. But if you say work, W is the work done by the system, then you say Q uh, delta U equals Q minus W. So this is just for your information. Don't worry about it too much. We're just going to be consistently using Q plus W as our delta U. Our convention here is if work is being done by the system, then that means the system is losing energy. So it's given algebraic sign of negative, a negative algebraic sign for our W. Okay? And if work is being done on the system, then that means your system is gaining energy as a result of work. Okay, and we give it a positive sign. Okay. Let's define a cyclic process. A cyclic process is a what's what's a cycle? Goes back to the beginning, right? So it's a series of processes where the system eventually returns to its initial state. So in a cyclic process, your final state is equal to your initial state. So for a cyclic process, what's your delta U? Zero. U final minus U initial. Since initial and final are the same, delta U is zero. So what's delta U for the surroundings? Zero. And what's delta U for the universe? Zero. Yeah. Let's say you have a system that goes through the following process, a two-step process. Step one, Q is 5 joules, W is negative 8 joules. Step two, Q is 15 joules, and W is 5 joules. For the overall process, what's delta U? How do you get delta U? Just add up all the Q's and W's, so it's just the sum of all the Q's and W's. So it's 5, 5.0 plus negative 8, plus for step 1, and 15 plus 5 for step 2. Those are all in joules. So what would that be? 17.0 joules. Positive. So did energy flow into the system or out of the system? So it's a net flow of energy into the system. Delta U for the surroundings is going to be negative 17.0 joules. Delta U for the universe is zero. Okay, so here's a question. Let's say you have a system that goes through the following process. Step one, it goes from step A, state A, equilibrium state A to state B, and you have your Q and your W for that. So it goes from uh, state A to state B, and so Q is 5, positive 5 joules, W is negative 8 joules. And then step 2, it goes back from state B back to state A, and Q for that is 15. So what's delta U for the overall process? It's a cyclic process. It's all zero. Common mistake students make is to add up all the Q's and W's here. If you add up all the Q's and W's, what do you find? Yeah, the second W is not given. Okay. So, I fell for this trick as a student, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> all right. So, Delta U for the overall process is zero. What's delta U for the surroundings? 
going to be zero. What's delta u for the universe? It's also going to be zero. What's w for stuff? So I guess I gave you a hint down here. All right, so you can say 5 plus negative 8 plus 15 plus w for step 2 must be equal to 0. So w for step 2 is how much? 20 minus 8. So that's this is 12. So negative 12.0. Talk about yes. Because W two this is twelve joules plus W two must be equal to zero. So W two itself is negative two in order for the total to be zero. Alright, so let's talk about uh, applying this now. Let's talk about an isothermal expansion or compression of an ideal gas. Okay? Uh, let's show that delta U is zero in, if, in fact, that Cp minus Cv is equal to Nr. And the way we do this is we imagine our gas to have initial to be in initial state with pressure P1, V1, and T1. So when you're, you define the pressure and temperature and volume of a gas, you're defining an equilibrium state, right? And then your final state is P2, V2, and then we're assuming this is isothermal, so what's our T2? Same as T1, right? Okay, so uh, let's imagine the following path. You have an isobaric heating and then isochoric cooling. Let me illustrate that with a diagram. That way it's easier for you to visualize, okay? So... Let's draw an isotherm here at T1. And let's do P1, V1 over here. So this is point number one. And I'm going to do point number two over here. Okay. So pressure over here is P1 and the volume is V1. Pressure at point number two is P2. The volume at point number two is V2. And uh, T1 and T2 are the same. Okay, so T1 is, is equal to T2. So what did we say we're going to do? We're going to show that delta U, okay, from going from step 1 to step 2 is going to, uh, from point 1 to point 2 is going to be 0 if Cp minus Cv is equal to Nr. Okay? So what do we do here? Isobaric heating. We're going to heat our gas, okay, from T1 to T sub X. But in the process, okay, we're, going to, we're maintaining pressure. So an isobaric process on this diagram would be what kind of, uh, what, what shape would that curve be? Straight line, horizontal or vertical? Isobaric. Horizontal pressure is constant, right? And we're going to go from V1, which is this one right here, right, to V2. Remember this volume right here is V2. We're going to expand to the volume that we want. So we're going to call this intermediate point right here X. So V sub X is going to be equal to V2. So that's an isobaric heating. Why? You're traversing isotherms, right? So you're going to be looking at a higher isotherm. Let's call this higher temperature T sub X. And then, so that's our step one. And then our step two is going to be what? Isochoric cooling. What does isochoric mean? Constant volume. While the volume remains constant, we now have the right volume, right? We have V2. We still don't have the right pressure. While the volume is constant, we're going to cool it. So we're going to uh, go down here. Okay. From T sub X, you cool it down to T2 so you get to your final state. So this is the path we're going to take. We're going to go isobaric heating and then isochoric cooling. 
and you end up with your final state at the same temperature as before, except that your pressure is now P2 and your volume is now V2. Right? So, uh, let's calculate Q plus W for each of these steps. We've already established the formulas for all of these in the previous lessons on heat and work, right? So what's Q for the first step and what's W for the first step? Q for the first step, let's see if we, we can follow this. Q for step one is Cp Tx minus T1. Is that correct? Q is Cp delta T, right? Assuming your Cp is constant. And what's our delta T? Tx minus T1, right? So that's correct. So that's Q1. So we know what Q1 is. What about work for step one? What's, what's the formula for work? Integral of negative P external delta V, dV, right? But our we have an isobaric pressure, and this is we're assuming we have a reversible process here, so our pressure, external pressure, is just equal to our pressure. So that's just minus P delta V. What's the pressure during this step? It's constant, which is equal to P1, right? So negative P1, what's our delta V here? Vx, V sub X minus V1, right? But our V sub X is the same thing as V2. Okay, so that's our W. So we have a formula for Q and W for step one. And then we do Q and W for step two. What's Q for step two? It's CV times T1 minus Tx. Why is that? Constant volume, right? So heat capacity at constant volume, CV. What's our final temperature? T1, which is the same thing as T2, right? What's our initial temperature? T sub X, right? So that's Q for step two. CV times T1 minus Tx. All right. Uh, which I can rewrite as negative of CV times Tx minus T1. Uh, I'm just flipping these two things inside here. So I, I have a negative out there. Okay, so I'm just doing a little mathematical manipulation there. What's W for step two? Constant volume. What's W? PV work for constant volume. What's delta V for constant volume? Your volume's not going to change. So V initial to V initial, or V2 to V2. So W for step two is zero. So we have formulas for Q and W for step one and step two. Okay, and these are our formulas right here. Now, uh, NRTX is equal to P1V2. Why is that? Here's, here's point X right here. What's our pressure at point X? P1. What's our volume at point X? V2. What is our temperature at point X? TX. So P1, V2 is equal to NRTX, right? PV equals NRT, ideal gas law. So NRTX is P1, V2. All right. What about P1, V1? We know P1, V1 is going to be NRT1, correct? P1, V1 equals NRT1. So given these conditions, okay, Given these, we can show now that Q1 plus W1 plus Q2 plus W2 is equal to zero. How? Oh. Let's uh, manipulate those. What's Q1? Cp Tx minus T1. What's W1? Negative P1. V2 minus V1. What is Q2? CV. Okay, I'm going to write it as negative CV TX minus T1. Okay. You know why I'm doing it that way? 
so I can factor out Tx minus T1 and I can get Cp minus Cv. And what is my W2? Plus 0. So this whole expression is equal to delta u. We don't know yet, right? But trying to show that that is going to be equal to 0. All right, so I'm going to simplify things here. I'm going to factor out Tx minus T1 here. So I have Tx minus T1. What do I have here? Cp minus Cv minus T1 V2 minus V1. That's your delta U. Okay. And that's your delta U. And we, what our goal here is to show that this expression is going to be equal to zero if Cp minus Cv is equal to NR, right? So we're going to replace this by NR. If Cp minus Cv is equal to NR, then this expression becomes NR Tx minus T1 minus P1 V2 minus P1 V1. Or I can rewrite this as NR Tx minus NR T1 minus P1 V1. So this is equal to minus uh, P1 V2. Oh, yes, plus. Thank you. Plus P1 V1. Okay, are we anywhere near to showing that this thing is equal to zero? Going back to what was NRTX? What did we say N1 NRTX is? P1 V2. So NRTX is P1 V2. Okay. What is NRT1? P1 V1. So minus P1 V1. So minus P1 V2 plus P1 V1. And the answer is... So what we've just shown is that uh, for an isothermal process involving an ideal gas, okay, the delta U is going to be equal to zero. So now, if I were to ask you, I have this isothermal process, okay, so from point 0.1 to point 0.2, and temperature T1 is constant. What if my process went this way? I went, I went up, I went this way, I went this way, I went that way, I went that way, I went that way, to get to my final state. What's, this, what's delta U for the whole process? What does the first law tell you? It's going to be the same delta U as if you did as if you did this one and that one, right? Which is what we did earlier. Same delta U. So delta U is still going to be equal to zero. And you can show that if you really want to. Okay? What's the delta U for this process right here? Just going straight from... Uh, from point 0.1 to point 0.2, just going on a reversible isothermal expansion. From point 0.1 to point 0.2, what's delta U for that? It's going to be zero, okay? <laughs> now, that's contingent on the condition that we said that Cp minus Cv is equal to Nr, which we will show later in the semester to be, in fact, okay, uh, a consequence of the idea of gas law. Okay, so once we get to our fundamental equation of thermodynamic, um, we can show that Cp minus Cv is in fact equal to Nr for an ideal gas. But for now, we're just going to take that, assume that, okay? Alright, so if I have a reversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, delta U is equal to zero, what's my W and what's my Q? We did W last time. What's W for an ex iso reversible isothermal expansion of a gas? Remember? Minus integral of PdV from V initial to V final. So from V1 to V2. 
And if it's reversible throughout the process, external pressure is equal to the pressure, right? And that's going to be equal to nRT over V dV, correct? Pressure is equal to nRT over V from V1 to V2. And what's the integral of nRT over V dV? So negative nR ln. Oops. Okay, I can factor out my T, right? T is constant. So minus nRT ln of V2 over V1. So that's my W. And so what's my Q? Well, we know Q and W must add up to zero. So that means Q must be equal to negative W. So our W is going to have to be positive nRT ln V2 over V1. Okay? So that's our Q and W for a reversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. Okay. What if you have an irreversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas against a constant external pressure? In other words, how would I carry this out? I have some, I have, I have pressure on my gas, right? So I've got pressure on my gas. I'm going to let it expand. So what do I do? I remove some of that block that I have up here, right? Pressure, external pressure. So my gas is going to expand. Okay, so it used to be here. It's now going to be here. Okay, I have less weight on it. So I have a smaller pressure on it. I lower the pressure right away. Okay. And so that's an irreversible isothermal expansion. How can I make this isothermal? Obviously, when I do this, if I remove that extra, uh, extra weight there to lower the weight, allow it to expand, what will happen? The gas is actually doing work, right? Work is going to be negative. It's going to be doing work. It's expanding against an external pressure. So you know that your gas is going to be losing energy. So uh, how does that... Uh, so you expect your ideal gas to cool down, right? So how can you make it isothermal? You make sure that your walls are not insulated. You give it enough time, what happens? Heat's going to flow in, right? So Q is going to be positive. And w is going to be negative. And your Q and W is going to add up to zero. Because in, for, in this particular case, delta U, we expect delta U to be zero for an ideal gas. Uh, by the way, you need to be aware every time that, that we apply something to an ideal gas, it does not ha necessarily have to apply to a real gas. Okay, So delta U equals zero for an isothermal expansion or compression that applies to ideal gases. When we look at real gases, that may not be the case. In fact, chances are it won't be. Okay. So, uh, how do we apply uh, the first law? The idea behind the first law is that when you, it allows you to define this state function u. Okay. And the nice thing about a state function is you don't. Um, have to worry about what path you take to get from your initial state to your final state. So even if the reality is you go from this state to this state, you take this path, okay, you can still figure out, even if you could not figure out, you, you did not have experimental information to actually measure, let's say, delta U for that process, you can imagine, okay, an imaginary, you can take it, you can think of an imaginary process that will accomplish the same thing such that each step in that imaginary process allows you to calculate delta u and you get, you're going to be okay you'll be able to figure out what delta u is all right so in other words it's like knowing an alternate route and to uh, go from one place to another okay even if you can't actually go there you can you can imagine how you can get there and you can figure out how much is, what the change is going to be okay so if you, go, if you have an ideal gas now, let's say you want to go from P1, B1, T1 to P2, V2, T2, where 
uh, you're, you may not be holding any of those quantities constant. Okay? You can show, okay, that you can actually show that C, delta U is just equal to CV times T2 minus T1. How is that possible? Let's pick a point. Uh, let's say you have a P1, B1, T1 right here, point number one. Okay, so there's P1, there's pressure. And there's your V1. Okay, so this is your volume. All right, pick another isotherm. You want a high temperature or low temperature? Pick anyone. You want a low temperature? Okay, I'm going to do another, another isotherm here. So this is going to be T1, and my lower temperature, I'm going to call that T2. Pick a point on that isotherm, anywhere. Ah, uh, let's go here. Okay. All right? So this would be, so this is going to be P V2, and this is going to be P2. So you're going from P1, V1, T1, to P2, V2, T2. None of those are held constant. What's delta U for that? For an ideal gas, that's just going to be equal to CV delta T. So CV times T2 minus T1. <laughs> Why? How can you prove that? Well, let's imagine, here's, here's the, what you do. You imagine a reversible isochoric temperature change. Okay? To the final temperature that you want. So I want to go... Where is that reversible isochoric temperature change on this diagram? I want to go from, isochoric means what? Constant volume. So it's going to be a vertical line from point one heading towards my final state, right? So I want to go to temperature T2. So from T1 to T2. So this is my first step right here. Okay. That isochoric step right there will take me to a final pressure P sub X, which I don't care what it is. I can solve for it. Okay. Uh, what would you know, what would you need to do to solve for PX, by the way? P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, right? Constant volume, pressure, and temperature are directly proportional. That's Amundsen's law. But I really don't care what that PX is because I'm not interested in it. So what's my Q for this step? From P1V1, T1 to PXV1, T2. My volume's the same, right? I change my temperature from T1 to T2. I change my pressure. What's Q for this step right here? Constant volume. Q equals CV delta T, right? CV T2 minus T1. So for this first step, Q is equal to CV T2 minus T1. What's W for that first step? Isochoric. Constant volume, what's W? Zero. Okay, so W for this first step is zero. All right, now, so what's delta U for that first step? Delta U for step one is what? Delta U one equals just Q1, right? Because W is 0. So it's going to be CV T2 minus T1 plus 0. So it's just CV times T2 minus T1. Okay. Why do I want to go here? Because now I can imagine going from here to my final state, isothermal. What's delta U for that second step? Isothermal, ideal gas, delta U is zero. Delta U for the second step. So what's the total delta U? 
is just the Q for the first step, CV times T2 minus T1. Okay, so that would be your formula for delta U for any ideal gas changing from P1, V1, T1 to P2, V2, T2. It's just delta, delta U is just CV times T2 minus T1. What is this telling us? That for an ideal gas, the internal energy appears to depend only on temperature. Doesn't matter what your pressure and volume are. For a given amount of an ideal gas, U depends only on temperature. The change in U just depends on the change in temperature. Okay? Let's talk about an adiabatic expansion now. So let's consider an irreversible adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas against a constant external pressure so that the final pressure is P2. All right. And let's calculate delta U, Q, and W for all of this. What's an adiabatic process? Okay, so here's my gas. And I have a pressure on this. Okay, so I'm going to put a weight on it. And what happens to my gas? I'm going to let it expand or contract. How do I make it contract? I put more weight on. Increase the external pressure. So this is my external pressure right here. How do I make it expand? I take off some of the weight, right? So I'm going to make, let's say, let's say I'm going to make it expand. So now it's going to be over here where it used to be here. And the reason I got that to expand because I suddenly lowered my external pressure. So P external is equal to P2. Okay. So you're going to reduce. You're going to reduce your P external to less P2, which is going to be less than the initial pressure. Okay, so suddenly your pressure outside is lower than the pressure inside, so your gas expands. Now, how am I going to make this adiabatic? What does adiabatic mean? Adiabatic means thermally insulated, right? No heat flow between system and surroundings. So I am going to make sure that this container right here is insulated, okay? So what's my Q then for an adiabatic process? Q is equal to zero. What do you expect will happen here? Your gas is doing work, right? So work is negative. It's expanding against a constant external pressure. Heat is not allowed to go in. So what's delta U going to be in this case? Positive or negative? negative okay delta u is q plus w it's going to be losing energy because it's going to be expanding against a constant external pressure so negative delta u w is negative q is zero what do you think the temperature of this gas is going to be higher or lower this is an ideal gas so you know your delta t is going to be also negative the temperature is going to drop right and uh, just to remind you, in that experiment you did with the boil slow, when you pulled out the syringe, okay, you're expanding the gas. Your gas was expanding against a constant pressure. You lowered the external pressure by pulling on it, right? So the gas was expanding. That's why I had to ask you to wait a few minutes for your gas before, uh, a few minutes before you take the measurement of your pressure because you want to make sure you want to give your gas time to go back to the original temperature. Okay, so the instant you pulled out that uh, syringe to expand your gas, what you did there was an adiabatic process. Okay, at that instant, but if you wait long enough, then that process becomes isothermal because you're giving heat enough time to flow back in to restore the temperature of your gas. Right. So, uh, what are we trying to calculate here? We're going to find what's the final volume, what's the final temperature, and what's delta U. Okay? So, what have we answered so far? Okay. Let's see. We know what the Q is going to be zero 
y skewed zero. Uh, because that's what we define the problem to be. We want an adiabatic process, so Q is zero for an adiabatic process. Therefore, delta U must be equal to W. Why? Because delta U is W plus Q, and Q happens to be zero. All right. So uh, we can also say that delta U is negative P2 times B2 minus B1. Why is that? What's our W in this case? Negative external pressure, which is constant, times the change in volume, which is going to be V2 minus V1. So delta U is just W. So delta U is equal to, okay, negative P external times V2 minus V1. And what's our external pressure? External pressure is P2. So this P external right here is just P2. So that's your delta U. Okay. Now we know delta U is minus P2 times V2 minus V1. Uh, what about this expression right here? Delta U is CV times T2 minus T1. Why? We just showed that earlier. For any ideal gas, if you go from P1, V1, T1 to P2, V2, T2, in an earlier example, we just showed that the internal energy just depends on temperature. So delta U is CV times T2 minus T1. Okay? So we got two formulas for delta U, and in both formulas, you have an unknown. V2 is unknown here. T2 is unknown here. Two equations, two unknowns. What do you do? You can solve for those two unknowns. That will allow you to figure out V2 and T2. And once you know what V2 and T2 are, then you know what delta U is going to be. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. You only have... You have three unknowns. I'm sorry. You have delta U is also unknown. Okay. Sorry about that. You have three unknowns. T2, V2, and delta U. We don't know what delta U is, right? So we can eliminate one of the unknowns by saying that delta U equals delta U. So minus P2 V2, uh, so minus P2 times V2 minus V1 equals CV times T2 minus T1. So that's one equation, two unknowns. Okay. So how do we solve for the two unknowns? We need another equation that relates those two unknowns. And what's that third equation? What's that other equation? It's this one right here. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. You have a fixed amount of gas, right? So the combined gas law is applicable here. All right, do we know? Okay, first of all, do we know P2? Yes. Do we know T2? No. V2 over T2. V2 and T2 are unknowns. But do we know V1? We know V1. Uh, P1, we know our initial pressure. Do we know our initial volume? Yes, we know our initial temperature. We know our final pressure, P2. So you have two unknowns here. Okay. So uh, that is how you would figure out uh, V2 and T2. Okay, so I just solve for these two equations, right? And that will allow you to solve for T2 and V2. Okay. Here's a variation of this question. Uh, this is a question you might find in one of the end of chapter questions in your book. Atkins. So consider an irreversible adiabatic expansion against a constant external pressure, P external, such that the final volume is V2, but the final pressure may not necessarily be equal to the external pressure. So it's a slight variation of the earlier problem. 
but this time we're not going to make the final pressure equal necessarily equal to the external pressure. How can we do that? Well, here. Imagine you have your piston right here, okay? And you got your external pressure here. So, um, okay, and you have your gas. And we're going to make this adiabatic, so I'm going to make my wall thicker. Okay, so adiabatic. I'm going to let this expand adiabatically by reducing the external pressure. Okay. <laughs> so, this is my initial volume. Now, earlier we said, uh, if we take out one of these, let's say, what will happen? What will happen to the volume? It will expand until pressure is equal to the external pressure, right? So this is the new external pressure right here. This is the the final external, the new external pressure, right? During this process, yeah, that's your external pressure. Yeah, that's just that one. You've taken out this extra one. But what's going to happen here is instead of letting it expand all the way, we're going to put a peg over here. Okay, so there's that peg right there. Okay. So you might expect that it would have to expand to that to that level right there when you lower the pressure. But you're going to prevent that from going all the way by blocking it over here. So instead of expanding all the way here, okay, so your gas is just going to expand up to this point right here. Okay, so now your P final, P2, is going to be greater than your external pressure. Okay, in the original case, in, 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 in the earlier problem we had, we made our P2 equal to P external. So if it went all the way up to this point right here, you might say that might be the case where your P2 is equal to the external pressure. So this is a variation of that problem. Okay. So how will we solve for this, uh, for the final volume? And uh, now, how do you solve for the final pressure and the final temperature? So here you're asked to solve for the final pressure and the final temperature. Well, again, you go back to your definition of an adiabatic process, Q is zero. So therefore, delta U is equal to W, okay? And so if delta U is equal to W, then delta U is just negative P external times V2 minus V1. Note our P external is given, okay, in this problem, but P2 is not. You're, so you're supposed to find out what that P2 is, okay? And uh, you're given the final volume, so you know where you blocked it, so you, you should be able to measure your final volume. Okay, so your gas would normally expand, right? But before it can expand all the way so that your pressure inside is equal to the external pressure, you block. So you specify how much volume you want it to gain. So you know, you know your V2, right? So you can solve for delta U, right? You know your P external, you know your V2, you know your V1. You can solve for delta U. Okay, so delta U now can be solved for. But we also know that delta U equals CV times T2 minus T1. Why is that? Again, ideal gas, U depends only on temperature. If you go from P1, V1, T1 to P2, V2, T2, we've already shown that delta U is just going to be CV times T2 minus T1. So what can I solve for here? I already know my delta U from the previous equation. I know my CV. I know my T1. What can I solve for? I can solve for T2. So from this equation, you can solve for delta U. From this equation, you can solve for T2. Okay. How do you solve for V2? Well, you solve, use the 
combined gas law. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. And then this last thing right here, you can just ignore that. We, in fact, already calculated delta U from the work. Since we know V2, we know P external, you know V1. supposed to end? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, we'll talk about this next time. Reversible adiabatic expansion. What, what time are we supposed to end? Ten minutes ago. Ten minutes